without further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to our first speaker. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Lara Katena. She is the, hi Lara, I'm just bigging you up. <laughs> Please come back. <laughs> She's the managing director, of course, of Catena Zapata, founder of the Catena Institute of Wine, the winner of our inaugural Old Vine Hero Award 2023. And really, I would say, uh, can I say that I know you're here, but I think a visionary and um, very inspiring figure in the world, not just of Argentine wine, but of, of the global world of wine. And Laura is going to speak to us about how an agricultural philosophy is using science to preserve the past. So if that's all right, Lara, I'm going to hand over to you and, and thank you so much for all your support and engagement with this project. Well, thank you and, and thank to, to you and to everybody listening because we all care so much about old vines. And if we don't care a lot and do a lot of things, they will disappear. So this is why it's so exciting to be here today. So I'm going to start sharing my screen because I have a little time and I want to tell you the story of our vines, our old vines in Argentina. Let's see. Are we here with the full screen, Sarah? Is it looking good? Yes, all I'm good. Gonna... It's all looking all good. good. Maybe I, I make uh, small the screen. Okay, very good. So um, this is just a, a picture I took with this beautiful old vine. They're so huggable and um Oh my God, I love these vines, we all do. Okay, so a little bit about our philosophy, Catenamics, to start. Uh, I was very dizzy at the beginning when I started working in wine. There were so many different things, you know, biodynamics, regenerative, you know, sustainable, organic, and all these philosophies are amazing. And uh, many of us practice them in different ways. Uh, but I felt like some of them did not apply specifically to my region um, and that we needed to do our own research to understand which practices work in our own re in our own region? And the research is really essential because um, we had this era in Argentina of all these uh, you know flying winemakers that would come and tell us things to do that did not work in our region. So that's when I started in the 1990s. And um, so we came up with this concept of catenamics, catena meaning connection or chain in Italian. So it's kind of the perfect uh, name for this philosophy. And Amex refers to the Greek uh, management. So Cadenamics is our sustainability inspired way of managing the connection between plants, soil, ecosystem, and people. And you might say, oh, well, that's so simple. We all do that. But it's very deliberate because our mission is to elevate Argentine wine for another 200 years. And our method is science to preserve nature and culture. And culture is just as important here as nature because so much of what we do in wine has to do with you know, thousands of years of culture. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how we apply this catenamics to the old vine issue, which is so, so important to all of us. Okay, a little bit about how uh, we do the catenamics. Uh, the Catena Institute of Wine, I founded it in 1995. This uh, was the project that got me excited about wine. I was a medical doctor, uh, practiced medicine and wine for 25 years, but uh, had actually no intention of getting involved in wine. I was going to drink all of the family's wines, but uh, not make them. But um, I got excited by this project of preserving Malbec and elevating the quality of Malbec because my father had had this crazy idea to make a pure Malbec from Argentina when nobody knew what Malbec is, uh, what Malbec was. Now we do. Uh, and so uh, I created the Catera Institute with this idea of studying the Malbec variety and what we realized was that we could buy these clones, we're gonna talk a lot about clones, from all over the world, you know, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, but there were no high quality clones from Malbec. So we had to do our own selection. Meanwhile, in Argentina, everything was Masal, everybody planted by Masal. So we only had Masal vineyards and our family has this very old vineyard that uh, helped us create this selection of Malbec that I'm gonna tell you more about later. Our mission, I told you already, to elevate Argentine wine. And we have published over 30 research papers in peer-reviewed journals, you know, well-known journals like Scientific Reports, American Journal of Enology and Viticulture. And the, the reason we publish is that if we're going to change a practice or do something different, uh, I feel like we need to be sure. And also, we share all this information with everybody in Argentina and the world, so we have to be sharing the correct information. And with climate change, 
I actually think it's even more imperative to do research before you change anything, because the implications uh, are very long lasting. And these are some of our partners around the world that we do research with in Argentina and outside of Argentina. And um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now to let's go back to the 16th century. Why is wine, uh, why are vines so widely planted in the Americas? Because, okay, we have the conquistadores uh, that brought uh, wine and wheat were the two main crops. I have a, a historian sister, Adriana Catena, an Oxford graduate who teaches me about the history of wine. It's so much fun. And these were the important crops. You know, today we eat other stuff, but back then, if you were a conquistador, you were going to a new part of the world, you needed to have wheat and wine. And I think that's why uh, wine, you know, is so much part of uh, the culture in the Americas because it came such a long time ago with uh, uh, so much force. This is an old map and just a little information for you to know that really by the 1600s, the wines of Peru, Argentina, and Chile, and I know you're going to hear about wines of Bolivia and Chile later, were already recognized for their quality, so much so that the, the Spanish king was out trying to outlaw them. But of course, we never did what the Spanish king said. And um, these wines were well known for their quality, but they were mostly Criolla mixes, uh, which are the, the what I call the native grapes of the Americas, because they, they occur from crosses of the vines that came with the Jesuits and with the conquistadores. And so those are our are, are sort of uh, native crosses. In come Michel et Mepouget, a Frenchman. So there, there's a lot of French influence in Argentina, not just uh, you know Malbec and all the other varieties uh, that uh, mostly come from France. We, we do make some um, you know Spanish varieties like Tempranillo and, and some Italian, but most of the varieties came at this time when this man, Michel et Mepouget, was an explorer. This was the era of exploration in the 19th century. And he comes to Argentina and he brings all kinds of varieties, not just Malbec. He brings Malbec, he brings Cabernet Sauvignon, Bonarda, many varieties. And he starts planting them and they become propagated. And there is not a lot of history written about this time. But what we do know is in the next slide is that by the 1970s, there were 50,000 hectares of Malbec. In Argentina, and think about it, pre phylloxera France, there were 40,000. So already by, you know, a century later, there's more Malbec in Argentina than there ever was in France. And in the 1990s, there's only about 5,000 hectares of Malbec in France because, you know, after phylloxera, the, uh, there were issues with Mélarandage, with Coulure, with Pourset. Uh, there's some uh, writings that say that Malbec didn't adapt well to grafting, many, many reasons. Uh, Malbec, which was more widely planted than Cabernet Sauvignon, almost disappears and comes to Argentina. And the reason why I think this is important is because if we don't do something, vines, species can disappear. And, and this is why it's so important that we're all here today. But then not only does Malbec almost completely disappear in France, but it almost completely disappears in Argentina. So when we have this thousand percent inflation, Nobody wants a low yielding variety, with this, which is Malbec. So actually Malbec starts going down and by the 1970s is down to 15,000 hectares and it's on its way down. And if it wasn't for my father having this vision that maybe I can do with Malbec what the Australians were doing with Shiraz, you know, which was to bring a new variety to the world. It wasn't new, but nobody knew Malbec anymore because it had you know, lost uh, fame. Uh, he has the guts to bring this Malbec back to the world in high quality wines. And then we have the Malbec revolution. And then, you know, today look at Malbec and Argentina. It's, it's This variety has done so much for our country, but really it, it's that kind of gutsy move that you have to do and somebody has to do it. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that my father had this vision. And today in Argentina, we're up to 46,000 hectares and France is about 6,000. So, you know, there's also a rebirth of uh, Malbec in some parts of France. So now to the juicy topic of today. When I was at the Masters of Wine conference, I had this incredible realization that is such a great conference. I highly recommend it to everybody. And uh, I did not know this, but you don't have to be a Master of Wine or even a Master of Wine student, I believe, to go to it. And it's so extraordinary, so many great speakers. And I heard at one of the panels, um, it was Gaia Gaia actually talking about how uh, they were working on massage selections. And all of a sudden, I realized because I talked to a couple of uh, people there 
that in Europe, most people don't know that in Argentina, and there's a lot of masal vineyards also in Chile, um, I don't know exactly the percentages, but you know, almost 90% of our vineyards are masal. And why is that? Because we've always planted by masal. You know, we just take the cuttings from your best sector and you plant that. And actually in Argentina, it's con considered very rude to not share your cuttings with your neighbors. So if your neighbor asks you for cuttings, you give them your cuttings. And we, we have our cuttings are planted all through Argentina, our Malbec cuttings, Cabernet cuttings, Chardonnay cuttings. Now it's, there's a bit of an issue with viruses, and I'm going to talk about that later. So it's not as simple. But until very recently, until maybe five years ago, when the consciousness about viruses started, this is how most vineyards were planted. Um, and ungrafted vineyards are up to 92%. So that's about 180,000 hectares of um, ungrafted vineyards and si similar amount of masal vineyards. And so uh, the reason why this is important is because a lot of these vineyards are old. I'm going to show you the data later. And if we don't preserve these, this genetic diversity, it will be lost to the world forever. And um, we'll talk more about that, why that's important as well. Okay, so how uh, did I become aware before this recent Master of Wine conference about the whole clonal masal issue? So I grew up in Argentina, in Mendoza, and uh, I, I started in medicine. So I was only a wine drinker when I started working with uh, my family winery. So I thought that all the vineyards of the word, world had masal plantings. And um, we were working on this um, colonial selection of Malbec, uh, but I somehow assumed that, you know, in the rest of the world, it, there were mixed plantings like we had in Argentina. So I went to this event in, uh, it's called the Naples Wine Auction, and this is Aubert de Vilaine, you probably recognize him. And this was in the um, kind of early 2000s, I think it was around 2006 or seven. And uh, I saw Aubert de Vilaine in, in this field I was very shy, wondering, do I go talk to him? Uh, and he was with his American wife, and I decided yes. And I wanted to tell him, tell him about my Pinot Noir that I'm making in Argentina at extreme high altitude. So I went up to him, and I uh, said, oh, uh, Monsieur de Villene, you know, I, I, you know we're making Pinot Noir in, Ar in Argentina. And he looked at me, and he says, well, uh, Madame, what do you have planted? And I said, well, we have the Dijon clones and you know the Pomar and the 777, 115. And I was very proud of, of our Burgundian clones. And he looked at me and he said, oh, that is not good. And I said, what do you mean that's not good? He said, no, we are working on our massage selections. And I said, oh, we have all massage selections of Malbec. And then we had this incredible conversation where he basically told me that is vineyard gold uh, and that's an extraordinary. He didn't know about it. And he was so excited by it. I came back to Argentina. I told my team, I said, oh, we always think we are this developing country that, you know, everything we have is not as good as what everybody else has. And, you know, here we are. We have all these massage selections. And, and it was about to be then that made me realize how beautiful and important this was. Uh, and this is Alejandro uh, Vigil, our, our head winemaker, um, who... Uh, went on this journey with me to go visit the Massa selections in Burgundy in 2014. And we had an amazing time. It was wonderful. Okay, so this is a little bit, I think we're here with a fairly technical crowd, but um, I just want to show you uh, in, in a glimpse uh, what Massa selection and a clonal selection might look like. So uh, we are humans. We we are such so bad to the earth, uh, but we like to see things in human terms. So here we go. Uh, so imagine that you have a vineyard to the right that's all messy, and then a vineyard to the left that's all these different football players or uh, soccer, as they say in, in some countries. Um, this is the difference between a Masal vineyard and a clonal vineyard. So there was a time in the 1950s, 70s, that people thought, why don't we have a vineyard that's all messy? Because we can we can actually take the messy vine and multiply it. And that's how clones were born, because people were thinking, you know, why not have the best one, you know, reproduce? And also it made it easier to have a vine nursery because you would have fewer plants and you would sell those plants and you would market, you know, a clone, you know, with a certain number, you know, uh, there's clones that are called for Cabernet, the Margot clone. And everybody says this actually came from Chateau Margot. 
and and people uh, talk about clones and they become famous and they become like a famous football player. Uh, but actually, uh, as it was shown by a, a, a team of a cloned uh, polo horses, uh, the actual diverse team does better than the clone team. So um, I think a lot of us are really questioning uh, this clonal method. On the other hand, I uh, believe that you can make beautiful wine from clonal vineyards and we have many clonal vineyards as well. So I'm not an anti-clone person. I'm just saying if we want to have genetic diversity for climate change in the future, we must keep uh, massage selections and we cannot allow any particular genetic vine to die because we can do that. You know, us people, we die bye bye. With vines, we can actually preserve them and we need to for the future generations. One second, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so a little bit about um, our Angelica vineyard. This is a vineyard uh, that has been in our family for a long time. This year, uh, we are actually celebrating the 100 years, uh, well, last year, uh, which is so exciting. And it was planted in 1922. And um, about half the vineyard has been replanted, but half the vineyard, and that's about 50, uh, 50 hectares, is still with the old vines, which are in actually pretty good shape. And the yields are lower than the new plantings, but not that much lower. So it's amazing. We, we've had a lot of conversations about this, how some old vines do so incredibly well with time and some not as well. And I, I don't really know exactly why that is, but this um, this vineyard is, is very fortunate in that there's so many old vines that are still thriving. So in 1995, <clears throat> the first project of the Catena Institute was this massage selection and clonal selection of Malbec. And actually, you know, I I always say that many of the things that happen to you in life have to do with uh, chance or, you know, not really a conscious decision. So we were um, uh, generating this um, clonal selection because that's what everybody else was doing, right? It was, you know, the 1990s, was it was all about clones. And we had 135 cuttings that we were studying because we actually wanted to pick those five clones that were the best. But because we hadn't finished the, the research project and we were planting vineyards, we actually decided that we would plant the Masai selection in the traditional method in all our vineyards. So actually the Mundus, this is the, the parcel of Mundus, which is probably our most famous Malbec. It, it had 100 points from Jane Anson um, for the 2019 is coming from a massage selection, but partly it was because we weren't ready yet to plant the clones, so we planted massage selections because I hadn't met Obelda Vilen yet uh, back then. So it's crazy how these little encounters and these these moments and things that happen somehow have a good result. And and always, I, I don't know, I always tell people, you know, your luck is almost more important than than your brain. Okay, so now about how different these selections are. I mean, look at this. So what this chart shows is kilos for plant. And underneath, when you see Malbec 64, 112, those are the different uh, cuttings. Uh, so look at the variety. We have a vine that is producing one bottle for vine and another vine that is producing seven bottles for vine. This is so different. You could not possibly want a vineyard planted with a mix of, of all this, right? Because you think there will be some that are riper or less ripe than the others. Like it, it, it would not give you a good quality vineyard. And that's why it made so sense, so much sense to do clones. But what we actually find is that these Massa vineyards adapt and the vines kind of adapt with each other and the ripening happens a little bit uneven, but not as uneven as you would think, given the, 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 the really diverse nature of these different cuttings, of these uh, Massa cuttings. And this is just a little example of three different cuttings. I mean, look at how different these bunches are. Yet, when you plant them together, something happens with that vineyard that you still get extraordinary quality. And the anecdotal evidence we have, and we are actually now starting a, a real research uh, study on this. There's um, research going on in Germany with polyclonal vineyards, in, in Portugal, I know, in Argentina. Um, what our um, viticulturists say is that on a really difficult year, the Massal vineyards do better because vines are at different stages of ripening. And so when you get hit by a frost, you don't lose everything or you know everything doesn't go down 50%. But in the easy years, it's the same, the, the clonal and the masal, and, may, and some years, maybe the clones are better. So here's 
you know, all the different climate phenomena that happened in Argentina, the Zonda wind, um, frost, hail. We all have climate phenomena. The Marsal vineyards are more resilient. And I think this research is really important because um, that's a big change if, if many uh, producers around the world decide to do this. And, uh, you know, people in Europe are going to have to go into their research institution uh, databases where there's diverse vibes, plant that, research needs to be done. And so this is very important. But today in Argentina, I'm going to show you uh, the slide in a minute, uh, we have those massal vineyards waiting to be studied. And, and that's one of my call, calls to action is we're doing research in Argentina but we need more research in Argentina. So I, I know there's some Argentinians here. Uh, everybody start doing research in, in your Masal vineyards. I know there's Chileans, you too, I know you are. We need to all do this research to show the world what happens in a Masal vineyard. This is what we call the Viñedo Supersonico, which uh, is a vineyard where we are keeping virus free. All the Masal selections uh, of Malbec, of Bonarda, of Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's so expensive, takes so much time, but um, we think it's really important to be keeping these selections, to be replanting them. And there's a family that lives here. I think you see this little boy on the right. And every time you arrive here, it's in the middle of nowhere because these vineyards um, have to be isolated so that they don't get infected by you know, viruses, by um, different kinds of you know, nematodes. Um, and so this family, uh, it's, a, it's a big family. Like, it's like 15 people uh, lives in this vineyard and everybody works in the supersonic vineyard. And this little boy, when you arrive, comes and greets you and he tells you about these plantitas, my little vines. And he, he can actually walk you through the vineyard and tell you all the names of the variety. And he's so proud of this. And it's so extraordinary that, that a family is dedicating their life to preserving these vines. And, and they, they are aware of how important their work is. And I love visiting them because uh, they're so passionate about what they're doing. This is the Rosas Vineyard, which is a somewhat sad story, but that I think has, you know, somewhat of a happy ending. Um, Mr. Rosas on the top left, this, this is when I'm visiting the family. Um, I think that photo is actually from 2006 or something like that. All those kids are in the picture are grown and um, Mr. Rosas' mom is still alive. And it's a very old, it was a very already a, you know, over 50 year old vineyard at the time. And uh, Mr. Rosas really wanted to sell it because um, his family was asking for money uh, because he was supporting a, a large family with his vineyard. And we, um, for 10 years, we convinced him not to pull it out. And then finally, one year he said, Laura, I know you really care about this vineyard. We were buying wine by the hectare, paying him a really good price, but he really he wanted to continue with his trucking business, which was his core business. He wanted to sell the vineyard and underneath you see the houses, you know, it really broke my heart because the vineyard was still, you know, it, it wasn't producing very high yields, but it was still productive and it was making such beautiful wine. But, you know, people have to make their own decisions. But Mr. Rosas was also very happy that we were taking his cuttings and he allowed us to come and take all his cuttings. And the vineyard to the right, which was planted in 2015 in Gualtasari Alto, which is, you know, the Boyac of Argentina is where the most expensive land is. Um, it, this is the site where we have planted this selection. And already we are getting some incredible um, juice from this site. And, and Mr. Rosas has come to visit, but I didn't get any photos. So I, I've asked him and he's coming to visit again because uh, he, he was so happy to come and see that the, the vines had been preserved. And I think that this is the kind of project that we can all do in our regions and we must do it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit later about how we are doing this and collaborating with our local uh, university. So a little bit about why is Argentina in this situation where we have all these Masal vineyards uh, and all this genetic diversity? And a little bit has to do with our developing country status. And again, you know, I was telling you before how sometimes things happen and, um, you know, it's just luck. So a lot of bad things happen in Argentina. This is a slide that shows, you know, we've had military governments. We've had almost 1,000% inflation. Right now, the inflation is 120%. It is so hard to do business in Argentina. Our government does not allow us to make outside dollar payments. They take all our dollars, pounds, all our foreign currency. And right now, they've run out of money, so we can't buy the money back. We can't pay employees who live outside of Argentina. We can't buy machinery, nothing. It's a terrible situation. 
we had these are we had five presidents in one week. We we're about to have an election. Everybody's very worried because we don't know what's going to happen. However, because of that, we've had something good happen, which is this Galapagos Island effect. For a hundred years, we had no material coming into Argentina, and this basal planting. You know, the reason why we didn't move to clones was because we weren't importing anything from outside of Argentina. It was too complicated. It was too expensive. So we ended up continuing to plant vineyards in the old traditional way. And today, we're so happy about this. But, you know, it wasn't necessarily for the right reason that this happened. It was because we were so isolated, like the Galapagos Islands. And, you know, sometimes isolation can be good. Isolation from the world. I mean, think of what happened when the Europeans came to the Americas. There was devastation uh, because new diseases came. So it's important to sometimes realize that being a developing country could have its advantages. Um, so what happens in the year 2000? So I told you about the age of exploration in the 1850s with Michel Aimé Puget, and we had another age of exploration in 2000. And somehow they're all men uh, that came to Argentina, but we now have more women coming from other parts of the world. But all uh, these very handsome men all came to Argentina and um, they have all created these beautiful wineries, have brought so much knowledge. And, you know, I actually think that, that um, foreign winemakers have had a really positive impact in Argentina and Chile because they've brought a lot of knowledge, a lot of know-how, and they've all been very generous with their knowledge. But the other thing that came with these consultants were the clones. And this is just a catalog of clones. And with these clones came viruses. And I'm not saying that <laughs> these um, you know, foreign winemakers brought the viruses because the, the viruses were everywhere. It's not their fault. But what I'm saying is once you open up, you're no longer the Galapagos Island and everything can come in. And vineyard viruses came. And right now, we have viruses in Argentina. We actually sent some material to be tested at UC Davis in the year 2007, and it was all virus-free. And now we have viruses all over Argentina. And I'm going to be done in about five minutes. This is just you know one testing, lots of positives, uh, because there was a time where, for example, even in France, um, leaf roll two was considered uh, not bad. So you could export material with leaf roll two. There's also a a, a virus called Pinot Grigio virus, which is not considered bad in, in some parts of Europe, but it is bad in Argentina. So this is a big problem. Uh, many uh, parts of the world are solving it by having, you know, cleaning of the vines, but this makes this whole massa planting a lot more complex because imagine that an average vine costs about four US dollars per vine, a little more, a little less, depending on the country. But Virus testing costs between one hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty dollars. So if you're trying to do a massa vineyard, you know, in the old days, you would just take the cuttings, look at the vine, say, "Oh, this one looks good." You take about ten cuttings from that one. You take about eight from this one. You take about fifteen from that one, and you would just put them in little pots and replant them. Now, if you want a virus-free vineyard, which with grafting, which is becoming necessary in some parts of Argentina, mostly due to water and nematodes, not phylloxera. You now have the, the potential virus in both the um, rootstock and the vitis vinifera. So, you know, virus testing is important and very expensive. So this is, you know, a big issue now in, in Argentina and Chile as well. Um, and one that we need a lot of help with as well. And I am so grateful for, you know, for example, FPS, UC Davis, they have helped us so much in the area of virus testing in Argentina. They've even sent people to talk to us in Argentina. Uh, and I'm so grateful for, for academics. I, I, I'm sure there's some act academics in the crowd for what you do for other regions, because we all need to help each other um, if we want to preserve this, this world of wine like, like we have it, because it's so important. Wine is so important. I can't live without my glass of wine. You know, I think a lot of us feel that way. It makes our lives so much better. Okay, old vines in Argentina. So look at these numbers. More than 50 year old vines before 1960. So that's, you know, um, more than 60 year old vines, 14,395 hectares. And more than 50 years old, 25,000. There are so many old vines in Argentina and they are all at risk. They're all of risk, at risk of replanting. And 
it's very exciting that the Universidad Nacional de Cuyo and INTA, these are our research organizations in Argentina. But just to show you how crazy our country is, there's one of the new candidates who will probably win the election has proposed to eliminate the INTA, the research uh, branch of the government, which I have a lot of complaints about the current government, but I, I love the INTA. They do incredible research. And if they get eliminated, it would be a disaster. So I, I don't know. I hope I'm not, I'm not saying who I'm going to vote for, but please don't eliminate the INTA. They have identified 250 vineyards for a total of 1,000 hectares of greater than 100-year-old vineyards. And they're going to do an assessment of the potential of replanting and do a program for non-replanting. And in cases where they're going to replant, sell, you know, what happened to the Rosal vineyard, they're going to take the cuttings. And we're partnering with them to take those cuttings and also replant them so that the selection is not lost. And I'm hoping that this conference will arrive to Argentina. I'm going to actually give this same talk. It's being translated to Spanish right now in Argentina to see what can we do to convince some of these growers to not replant. I mean, the first thing you can do is pay people more for their grapes. And that's what we're doing, paying by the hectare. That's something that I started 25 years ago. But we need to do more of that. We need to talk to people uh, because I think that it, it would be a crime if these vineyards get replanted that are still producing grapes and being used for making wine. Uh, and they're uh, saving these selections. Uh, they're hoping for 250 to 500 individual genotypes in this uh, vine nursery of the INTA out of about a thousand potential genotypes. And we are going to be planting uh, some of these cuttings from these old vineyards in Luján de Cuyo in what we call the vineyard of El Viejito de Rivadavia. And I, I just want to tell you the story of why we call this vineyard El Viejito de Rivadavia. The El Viejito de Rivadavia is the old man, um, well, the little old man, because we, we call everything Ito that's cute. Um, everybody calls my dad cute and, um, you know, papacito. Uh, Viejito de Rivadavia is um, the, the name of this vineyard because what we thought to ourselves was what if we could take a man like this one, I'm going to tell you his story, and a vine, like all these old vines, and save them. And, you know, they're like people, these vines. We actually have the capacity to save their genetic material for the future. And um, this man um, is, um, we, we were doing a photo shoot, and I was being shown the photos from this vineyard. I hadn't met him. He worked at one of our vineyards. And when I saw his photo, I asked him, I said, oh, my God, you know, he seems rather old. Uh, but very happy. And I said, are you sure, you you know, we're not doing elderly abuse by by letting him work? Like, it, shouldn't he be retired? And so my team uh, that was doing the photo shoot asked him, I said, they, they actually asked him, I said, please ask him. He said, oh, my God, I don't want to be in this photo. This means that you're going to force me to retire. And, and, and they said, no, no, no. And he said, if you make me retire, you take my life away. I want to keep on working. And, and I said, no, no, of course you can keep on working. And we took this photo and this man is still working in our vineyards. And, you know, the beauty of that person, the beauty of that old vine, we need to fall in love with it again and again so that we can preserve these vineyards for the generations to come because climate change also demands it. If we don't have this genetic diversity, they would be, there could be climate change situations where we've lost the genetics and then we will not be prepared. And so this is so important. Uh, one last thing is I've written a bunch of books and part of why I write books is because I feel like if when you tell the stories of these places, of these vines, you prevent some of these bad things from happening. You know, old vines from being pulled out. When people fall in love with the old vine vineyard, I'm always uh, struck by the story of the Hill of Grace by Henschke, for example, this vineyard that is so famous. I mean, if I were Henschke, I, I would just never pull it out because you know, everybody in the world knows it. You can't pull it up. So when you tell stories, um, you know, the Our Old Vines Conference, what, what you are doing here today, you prevent a vineyard from being pulled out. So um, it takes a lot of work to write a book, but I recommend to anybody, if you have a passion for something in your region um, and you can get a publisher, that's also very hard. Write your book, write articles, social media all the time because you can make a difference. One person can make a difference. And then that's the call to action is, you know, you can make a difference. These are some of the handles we use. And the other thing I want to mention was we have a, a, a critical situation in Argentina that we can't take dollars out, as I was saying, because of the government. And so I'm uh, 
probably starting a foundation to help this research institute in Argentina to be able to buy kits for genetic testing for these old vines. And when I start this, I will announce it on my social media. And, um, you know, I don't always want money, um, you know, well, I'm going to put some of our, our wineries money and hopefully I'll be able to get funds from Argentina, but just support people talking about what we're doing is already a lot of help. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. I see uh, Sarah, okay. Laura, thank you so much. I really enjoyed what you would, how you encompassed culture, obviously family history um, and um, your call on the, the polyclonal vineyard research and um, the whole, how it's essentially head and heart. There's a survival imperative, but then there's also actually almost a muse effect because there is yeah. an idea that's very beautiful. So uh, thank you. We've got some good questions, which I'd like okay. to put to you. So Etienne Niesling, who's also, by the way, Etienne, thank you also so much for your comments in the chat. Um, I, I think Etienne is um, obviously um, uh, works in viticulture, but he has a question for you, which is, yeah. is current vineyard planting still dominated by mass cell selection or by clonal selection? And this, he's got two questions. And then yes. follow up is, is there data supporting or indicating he says is there data supporting trends in massal versus clonal selection in argentina so right now i actually don't have the data on how much is being planted of one or the other but the vine nurseries have both they, that would be fairly easy data to get actually and i'm going to make a note of getting that because i i agree that it's interesting we could just survey all the, the nurseries and ask them, you know, how much are you selling Masal and Clonal? So for us at Catena, we're, I would say we're doing about 50-50 and mostly has to do with availability of virus-free material. Um, so uh, the Masal plantings that we're doing are still in places where we're planting ungrafted. So for, the grafted vines we're doing more clonal because it's so expensive to do the virus testing that our massal um, selections that you know we we currently have 50 of the clones that are virus free and we don't even have enough material to plant with that so when we plant grafted which is in some regions that have really rocky soils and with a lot of nematodes we are planting grafted in places where we can plant ungrafted, we're planting masal pretty much everywhere because we have a lot of that material, but that's not virus tested. So after going through a moment of deciding we're never going to plant anything with viruses because we had one selection that actually was sold to us from Europe, I won't say from by whom, but that had so much virus that it, like we lost several hectares, a, lot, a big part, we had to plant, pull it out, you know, four years later, we decided we're going to plant everything virus-free. And then we realized that that was impossible because we couldn't keep the massage selection. So we, what we've made is this decision that we're, when we can, we plant virus-free and when we can't, we plant without knowing. We do our best selection just looking at the plants, which is not very good. You can't detect virus by look, you can detect really bad virus, but so to answer this question, I don't know the answer, uh, but both are happening. And a lot of it has to do with if you're planting virus free or not. Good and bad is that a lot of people in Argentina don't care about virus. And um, that's partly why we decided, well, if nobody else cares, let's not be so strict because we could get a virus from the neighbor vineyard and we would have done all this work and all this expense to be virus free. And we could get a virus with one little nematode bouncing from one virus to the next because nematodes can carry viruses. So um, a lot of people are still planting masal a lot of people are still planting ungrafted, but if you're planting in a vineyard in certain areas that have very sandy soils, anything with nematodes, it's you're better off planting grafted. So I think those numbers for grafted and ungrafted will change in Argentina. Uh, what I'm hoping though is that um, there, this is my big hope is that with science and actually thanks to what's happening in hum humans, this is crazy to say thanks to, but with the COVID pandemic, there's been so much research into viruses going on that I'm hoping that there will be less expensive virus testing 
And that's why it's so important to preserve all these massage selections, even with virus, like the Viejito de Rivadavia vineyard, that is probably filled with virus. I don't care because I think that there will be a way to take, you know, you can actually develop a new vine without virus from a virus infected vine through the Meristema. So I'm thinking that that technology will be so much more advanced 10 years from now that we'll be able to reproduce all those vines and go back to, you know, just being able to take a bunch of cuttings from a massage selection, make sure they don't have virus, reproduce them real quickly and plant it and we'll all be fine. I'm waiting for that technology to be developed and be less expensive. But if we don't preserve those selections, then we don't have that option. So I hope I gave the answer. I think that's um, a really interesting question. And um, actually Etienne's come up with, um, I, I think Etienne must be based in France. And he says yeah. that for example, in France, they have a, a clonal garden of 440 Chenin Blanc, Blanc clones but four clones represent 90% of the vineyards. The same is true for other varieties in France. The only variety with about 30% massal selection is Pinot Noir in France. But it sounds like you should be able to start to get this data, oh, which yeah. is, is great. It's great to see this kind of then ongoing research, kind of yeah. live pinning down of, yeah. of facts inspired yeah. by these questions. Um, well, well, just a yeah. quick thing that what Etienne says, there is a lot more knowledge about the genetic diversity in France because they've actually done the research. In Argentina, we have all these massage selections that are pre-phylloxeric. We know they're pre-phylloxeric because nothing came into Argentina for 100 years. But we're just now starting to really study the genetic diversity. Uh, and that's that project that I showed. So, um, yes, France is, is you know, maybe we have more massage vineyards, but France knows a lot more about what they have than we do. Yeah. Thank you. Another couple of questions. Robert Piet, question for Dr. Catena. In the very recently published fifth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine, I have read under Old Vine, quote, reputed to produce grapes which make better quality wines. The phenomenon is largely anecdotal with few scientific studies having been undertaken. You point out, that's the quote, he then says, yeah. you point out the research is, that research is essential and your institute cooperates with famous universities. Do you agree with the second sentence of the entry? Hardly any scientific proof. Uh, we have one paper, uh, I don't know, we didn't publish this, but we did do the research on this, uh, where we were actually comparing the vine to the mugron, which I did that video recently that, that you posted. Uh, so the vine with the mugron, you know, the, the baby plant that comes from a vine. And we actually yeah. compared the quality of the old vine to the new vine that was coming from the same vine, which was in a way a, a good control because you had the same genetic material and same soil. And we actually found that there was no difference. They were the same. Like we did separate winemaking, everything blinded, because we had a vineyard that had a lot of mugrones. It's not the same as if you took, you know, the same exact clone would be better probably to study this because anytime you get a massage selection, it'd be hard to get the same exact one. So I think that part of the issue is that it's very hard to answer this question correctly because it's very hard to do the research. And the research we did did not show anything, but, you know, is is comparing a mugron to the to the yeah. mother vine. Is that a good way to answer this question? That's the only research we've done and we showed that there was no difference. Um, I personally think that some of the appeal of a wine is the story behind it. So when I'm told that a vine comes, a wine comes from this really old vineyard, there is a subjective falling in love with that wine. And, and I think that that's actually good enough for me. I, I, and now that we have this genetic imperative to preserve those vines. I feel we have a second reason to be in love with these old vines, that we must preserve the genetic diversity. So uh, even if there's no research, I still believe that the story behind a wine, that subjective feeling you have when you drink it um, also counts. And I, you know, I'm a scientist, but I believe in that as well. I, I, I completely agree. Um, but also I am aware of two respected and rigorous studies where they have been able to isolate this so there's one from Australia um, conducted by Dr Dylan Grigg which was an award-winning thesis for his doctor for his doctorate in viticulture I've just put the link in the chat Dylan is actually okay. 
joining us to speak oh. about his uh, his research. Okay. So tune in tomorrow because he will be okay. speaking about this research. And he was able to isolate and, and have a control of same same um, cultivar, so Shiraz, same essential terroir, very different vine ages. And he showed that uh, there was a difference, um, an advantage in old vines and a difference in grape composition. I put the link in to the um, abstract for that in the chat just now. There's also a study that um, I think is a more recent study that has just been completed um, in California on old vine Zinfandel, which I will also find and put in in the study. And I I agree with you on this sense of the imagination that is sparked by wine. I mean, when you think what wine is and what wine drinking is, it's kind of collective ritualized drug taking. And I mean this in a positive way, you yeah, know, but, um, absolutely. but it changes our mental state. It is a transcendent experience. So yeah. I think to pretend that the, the story isn't part of the appeal of wine is to say that music is just, you know, sound waves. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, but, but, but Robert, there there are studies and i'm i believe that there are more studies underway um oh yes that's right anna harris noble has just reminded us of a really exciting study that's being undertaken by one of our old vine conference members campo de borja um how vine age affects aging capacity and flavor a very comprehensive study well done to nacho for getting that through and with the results expected in 2025 oh great I also have a question that's come through on the chat from um, Filippa Pato, a marvellous winemaker and old vine um, champion in Portugal. And she's asked, um, Laura, do yeah. the ungrafted Malbec plantations survive dry farming? Well, so in Argentina, we our traditional way of farming is with the glacier water of the Andes, which these canals were established by the native peoples before the Spaniards came to Argentina. And without uh, this water, we do not have vineyards, we do not have crops. And this is actually something that I talk a lot to with Europeans because, you know, when I first started going a lot to France, you know, people would say to me, Laura, you know, an irrigated vineyard cannot be good because there was this notion, you know, in Europe that when you irrigate, you're just doing it to increase yields. In Argentina, we have a traditional way of irrigation that is basically you, you have what I call vineyard artists, and it takes about 10 years to train somebody on how to water. And they mostly look at the vines. We do do some measuring, you know, with a Scholander pump. But in the end, it's mostly visual and looking at the what's going to happen to the weather. And it's not, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It's we have the the moments where we do a little more stress, the moments where we allow uh, more water. So to answer that, we don't do dry farming. You know, there's a few years like 2016, we were able to dry farm in some places, but pretty much every year we're going to have to water uh, our vineyards at some point. Um, so. Uh, we have not found, like in other parts of the world, I, I hear that, you know, people are finding that ungrafted vines do better with water stress. We have done some research on that, and we find that the Paulsen um, Bortengerto, the, the rootstock, is actually more... Uh, so... Um, it, with climate change, there could be an argument. However, it's not a lot better and it depends on the region. So to answer your question, we don't, we always have to use a little bit of water. I think the ungrafted wine, vines do quite well, but we are expecting more water stress. And, and that's a question that we are studying. And we actually have somebody doing a PhD on water to answer this question. And we I don't know if everybody else is frozen. Um, I can hear you okay. You've frozen a little. Ah. Oh, unfortunately, that's rather, that's unfortunate timing. We've lost Lara just as we were coming to the end. Oh, she's back. Great. Oh, <laughs> you're back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, oh. Well, okay. I say bye bye because I don't want to. We're at the end anyhow. Lara, I just want to thank and, you. And my communication is bad. Yes, but thank you so much. Amazing insights. Always very honest very detailed, very transparent. Thank you for your generosity. And we look forward to hearing more. And as I say, Laura was, uh, Lara was our inaugural winner of the Old Vine Hero Award. And can I just say that while you're still here, we are launching next year's Old Vine Hero Awards in 2024. So do look out for that, everyone. It's a People's Choice Award. You can see that it um, always recognizes incredible talent and 